we're going to start talking about the legislature. You know, when we talked about the Constitution, at that time I told you that the Constitution has to have uh, certain parts or certain elements to say how the state is going to be run. And so one of those elements that it has to have speaks to the separation of power or the branches of government. You might may be more familiar with that term. And so the different branches of government are the legislature, the executive office, and the judiciary. And so we call these the political institutions. So we are going to be starting to cover the institutions now. And so in this particular one, and there's two parts to this lecture, we're going to be talking about, about the legislature, what it does. And so the primary function of the legislature is to pass laws for either the country or any state and particularly for Texas. So this particular lecture is geared very much towards the Texas legislature. So specifically, we're going to be talking about the citizen legislature, and that's what it's called because they don't really serve, you know, full time. They're not elected to serve full time because of the way the Constitution set it up. We're going to be talking about districting and gerrymandering, and you may probably have never heard of these terms, but we'll talk about it. We'll talk about the qualifications to be a member either of the House of Representatives or of the Senate both the formal and the informal qualifications. And then we will start talking about the presiding officers and the legislative leadership and the role that they play within uh, the Texas legislature. Okay, so the Texas Constitution of 1876 said we are going to have a bicameral legislature. And bicameral legislature just means that there are two chambers. There's a Senate and there's a House of Representatives. As you can see that there are more Senate members, uh, I'm sorry, more House of Representative members, 140 members, as opposed to only 31 members for the Senate. And so there's a reason for this and it involves the districting in these single member districts and we'll be talking more about that. It is often said that the Senate may be more prestigious, it's called the upper house, and many times the people that are senators that are elected as senators have been House of Representative members prior to them being elected as senators. But they have equal power, but it is often said that the Senate tends to be more uh, prestigious than the House. Okay, this term citizen legislature means that they only serve part-time, that they serve the state of Texas part-time. So they are elected. All of our politicians are elected. The Senate tours are elected for four years as opposed to six years at the U.S. level. The House of Representatives are elected for two years, the same as at the U.S. level. Now there are no term limitations, which means that we they will serve as long as people are electing them in. So uh, as long as they run and people vote them in, they can serve without any kind of term limits. And a term limit is basically saying you can't serve in a capacity more than so many years. Well, we don't have that here in Texas. Now, since they're part-time, they don't get paid a whole lot. They get paid $7,200 plus, uh, plus $132 a day for expenses. And this is while they're in session. While they're not in session, they don't get paid. So what that means is that they have to have other sources of income. And many of our uh, politicians tend to be attorneys. They tend to be lawyers. And we'll talk more about that uh, in, the next, uh, in the next presentation. Now the Constitution said we do not want our politicians to be in, uh, in session for very long periods of time and so the Constitution set it up saying that our, uh, our uh, legislators are only going to meet every two years for 140 days in odd years. All right, So we had a legislative session in 2015. We will have the next legislative session in 2017 and then the one after that in 2019. So in odd years and only for 140 days. So what happens is because they have these infrequent sessions, what it uh, results in is like tremendous amount of bills being introduced, voluminous pieces of legislation. I'm talking thousands of uh, pieces of legislation. I'm talking 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 pieces of legislation. So you should be wondering how can they possibly get through all that? Well, we're going to be going through that in the next presentation. Okay. I. Uh, mentioned 
a little bit ago that our uh, representatives and our senators are elected from uh, single member districts. And, and what that means is that we have one member per house district and one senator per Senate district. So we're going to be talking a whole lot more about districts, how they're set up, uh, and, and you know uh, why they're set up that way. So the districts are based on population. And so every 10 years we have a census and a census is the, uh, the counting of people within any particular area, city, state, and it has to be done at the national level. And so the, the, the uh, thought behind this is that these districts should be approximate in their population. Uh, they, they should have approximately equal population. It doesn't have to be exactly equal, but approximately equal in their population because it's one person, one vote, and they don't want one district to be more dense, like population dense, and carry more weight than any other district. Okay, I wanted to show you this map, and these maps are in the book. And so, uh, you know, they may be a little bit hard to see, so you can look at the book if you want. But this one is from the Texas House of Representatives. And what you should be looking at are two things. One, you can see that in the urban areas, the districts tend to be kind of small. In the uh, rural areas, they tend to be a little bit bigger. But the reason that they tend to be smaller in the urban areas is because the population uh, uh, density is higher there than in the rural areas. The other thing that you should be noticing is that you see that Texas is red in at least, what, two-thirds of the state, maybe a little bit more than two-thirds of the state, and it's Democrat in other parts of the state. So you can see if you can find your own county and see if it's a, a, red, a red district or if it's a blue district. And then when it comes to the Texas Senate districts, this is the second slide here, uh, you, you should be able to notice that the, uh, that the districts tend to be larger. They tend to be larger, which is why we have fewer districts, Senate districts, than we do uh, House districts. And again, you can see just by looking at this, at this map that it's Texas is like, what, two-thirds Republican, about one-third Democrat. And the Democrats are basically in South Texas. Okay, so let's talk about this term called reapportionment. And so what that means is that we take this, these numbers that come out in the census, the population count, and we have to kind of like figure out how they're going to be uh, calculated. And so the reapportionment part of it is, means that you have to redraw the district lines every 10 years when the census comes out. It has to be reapportioned. So redrawing the district lines. And so uh, either the legislature can do it or uh, the legislative districting board can do it. And that's like a special board that can meet if the legislature doesn't want to do it. But by far, it's always the legislature that wants to do it. They will come in for special sessions in order to redraw these district lines. As a matter of fact, there was a situation, and this was the 2000 census, where um, the, it was a Republican uh, uh, dominated uh, legislature and the Republic, the Democrats kept running away because they knew that the way that the lines were going to be drawn were probably going to benefit the Republican Party so they kept fleeing. They went to New Mexico, they went to Oklahoma so finally they had to like buckle down and just do it. Okay so this part is called redistricting and so they have to redraw the districts and the way that they draw the districts you would think that it would be they would be little squares or little rectangles but they're not they might have like little fingers or little toes and so what they're trying to do is that they're trying to draw the districts so it will benefit a certain party or benefit a certain ethnic minority so political careers may be at stake and so the big deal about redistricting is since it's only done every 10 years, it's going to affect policymaking or the, the types of laws that are passed for the next 10 years, for the next decade. And so what, uh, that when they redistrict, what they're trying to do is they're trying to dilute or neutralize the power of ethnic or political minorities. They're trying to minimize that power. They're trying to say, we don't want for either at this point in time, the Democratic Party to be very dominant. We don't want, uh, especially the Hispanic population, because it is the Hispanic population that has the largest growth rate here in Texas. So when they redistrict, 
they're trying to neutralize these uh, minorities. And so they, there's uh, certain ways that you can do it, techniques that you can do it, and the, and the technique is called gerrymandering. And so gerrymandering is drawing the district lines to give candidates from certain parties, ethnic groups, or factions political advantage. And so gerrymandering has taken place the way that the uh, line, the lines, the redistricting lines have been redrawn here in Texas based on the 2010 census is currently in the courts. And that has not yet been settled because it appears that there is uh, 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 gerrymandering going on, that there is racial gerrymandering going on, that there is political gerrymandering going on. And so it had to go up to the courts. And, it, and we're talking about the courts at the federal level because you all don't know this. But at this particular point in time, and for a very long time before this, Texas has been uh, under the watch, the oversight of the U.S. Department of Justice because uh, Texas has had problems with disenfranchising uh, certain uh, parts of the population. And basically, it's the ethnic minorities. Basically, it's the Hispanics. Okay, that's another way of saying there are, have been voting problems. There have been voting irregularities. We still have the Department of Justice watching us to find out, you know, uh, uh, is South Texas, are those votes being counted? Are the people not being neutralized too much? So, okay, gerrymandering. So let's talk about some techniques that uh, you can use or that the legislators have used in order to neutralize uh, the parties or the minorities. Okay, the first one is called cracking or diffusion diffusion and so what what this one is is saying you know if there's a lot of people like the population count is too great in one area we're going to draw those districts to kind of like diffuse them out kind of spread them out so to diffuse a concentrated political or ethnic minority so that votes within any one district are, are neutralized so they're saying we have a lot of uh, uh, ethnic minorities or a lot of Democrats because again the, uh, since 2002, Texas, uh, the Texas legislature has been very Republican. So they're saying we need to neutralize either the political party, which are the Democrats, or the ethnic minority, which at this point are the Hispanics. We are going to spread them out. So that way they can't influence the uh, elections very much. Now the second technique is called packing. So if the minority members are still too high in one area, what they will do is they will try to pack in as many people of either the party or the population into one district and saying, okay, we know that this district is going to probably be of a political, you know, certain political party. And so that way, you know, they may elect someone of their party, but it's going to be a minimal influence. It's only going to influence one election. It's going to have minimal legislative influence. Okay, so so cracking is spread them out. Packing is put them in together, pull them in together. And so that way it's only going to have minimal influence and it's only going to affect one election. I wanted to show you an example or a graphic of this uh, gerrymandering technique that I was called packing that I just explained just a minute ago. If you look at, at the uh, graphic or the square on the left-hand side, this is what the districts would look like if uh, they were drawn exactly like little squares. So you have uh, the Democrats and the Republicans would have a 50-50 shot at being uh, elected because there's as many Democrats as there are Republicans. So in this uh, packing technique, gerrymandering technique, it's saying let's draw the lines to give one party an advantage or to get uh, to uh, get give the other party a disadvantage at being elected and the way that we do this is by putting them all in one district. So if you look at the district that has, this is done by the a Democratic uh, state legislature, if you look at the graph on the right hand side you see there's one little box that has a whole lot of red and not that much, that many blue. It's got, let's see, there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and there's only two blue dots. So that's saying that the Republicans have an advantage in that particular district. So yes, you might have a Republican uh, being elected from that district and it'll kind of minimize the impact that the Republicans would have. But basically this is saying it's giving the Democratic Party 
uh, the uh, the advantage in getting their uh, their candidates elected into office. As I said, this is a packing technique. Both parties use it. It's called gerrymandering. The last one is pairing. And so the pairing involves incumbents. And incumbents are basically, as, we, uh, as I talked to you before about it, it means the people that are holding office, currently holding office. Well, sometimes what happens is that they may want to get rid of one of the people, the legislative leadership, and we're going to be talking a, a lot more about the legislative leadership. And so that legislative leadership is basically the lieutenant governor, the speaker of the house, and the committee chairs, but specifically the uh, lieutenant governor and the speaker of the house. Uh, if, if there is a legislator who has not been supportive of what the lieutenant governor or the speaker of the house wants in terms of uh, uh, advancing different types of legislation or what their agenda is that's how we how we say it of their agenda they may say you know what we want to get rid of this legislator so what they will do is that they will use this pairing technique so they're going to draw the district lines so that two incumbents are both in the same district because that way they know one of them is going to be defeated and so the one that they want to defeat is the one is the way to punish this legislator who has opposed this legislative leadership that I'm talking about saying you know this guy's never really played ball with us he's never been supportive of us so we're gonna to try to get rid of him and so they will use this pairing technique and so uh, the pairing is used to protect the right kind of incumbent those who are supportive of the legislative leadership and to uh, and who, who support the the agendas of the legislative leadership and of those powerful special interests, which are basically here in Texas, the business groups, the business groups. Okay, so these, uh, uh, there are certain qualifications for uh, our politicians to be elected, for our legislators to be elected. There's formal and there are informal qualifications. Now the formal quali qualifications are not that many, like to be a, a Texas senator, you need to be a U.S. citizen, a registered voter, at least 26 years of age, that you have to have lived in Texas for at least five years and lived in your district for at least one year. So there's really not a whole lot of formal qualifications. Now, when it comes to the House of Representatives or the state reps, again, there's not a whole lot of formal uh, qualifications. You need to be a U.S. Senator, a U.S. citizen, at least 21 years of age, and that you have had to live in Texas for at least two years and lived in your district for at least one year. So what happens is a lot of times it's the informal qualifications that may be more important than the formal qualifications and these informal qualifications include the political aspects of it or your party, the social aspects of it and the economics uh, aspects of it. So let's talk a little bit about these three. Okay, when it comes to the political aspects of it, you know, I have talked to you about uh, the Republican Party. We've gone through several sections of this and we went through the section on the parties and it said, and uh, I told you at that time that the, that the Republican Party started to take control of uh, the Senate and as well as the House and it, it was kind of staggered. So in 1996, the Republican Party gained control of the Senate. And the House uh, retained control of the, uh, uh, the, the Democrats contain, uh, retained control of the House. But in 2002, and that's kind of a landmark year, guys, 2002, that, and this is when the Republicans gained control of both chambers, that the Republicans gained control of both chambers. So that's when Texas became more Republican. When Texas, and I'm not saying that there's not any Democrats. There are Democrats, but it became more conservative, more Republican. And so it's not an ideological shift because a lot of the conservative Democrats voted for Republicans. They're saying, you know what, this particular Democrat, we don't support him. We're going to go ahead and vote for the Republican guy. So it's not so much in a, an ideological shift. And so uh, the people that are going to be elected into office are going to be those that, again, have minimal opposition to the legislative leadership. And again, we're going to be talking a lot more about the legislative leadership. And that's basically saying we are going to, the legislative leadership will try to get politicians elected in the, into office that are going to support whatever the agenda items are for the, uh, you know, uh, for the Senate or for the House of Representatives. They want somebody who's going to be 
be who's going to support this legislative leadership. Okay, so when it comes to the Texas legislature, there's a, a strong male dominance, a strong male presence, I guess you could say. You know, in the state of Texas, about half of the population is women, are women. Uh, and so based on some of the data from 2011 and 2012, you know, there's an indication that, you know, uh, while women, women have made strides in getting elected, it's certainly not at in, within the same proportion as the population that they represent. Okay, for example, there are only 19% female senators, 21% House of Representative members. So certainly not that 50%. I mean, some gains, but certainly not at the within the proportional levels that it should be. Uh, and then when it comes to money, we did a little section about campaign financing. And so I talked to you about what uh, money is used for in the campaigns. So uh, so these politicians really need to be able to fundraise. They need to be able to get people to contribute to their, uh, their, their elections in order to finance their campaigns. And in 2006, they raised 95 million for both chambers. That's a lot of money. And even since that time, I think this is the last one that the book has, but it's been increasing and increasing and, and increasing. So it takes a tremendous amount of money to run for office. And so it is often said, uh, this is according to the book, that the key ingredient in Texas politics is money. Okay, so I talked a little bit about the presiding officers. And so uh, let me talk a little bit about more what that means. You know, there's got to be somebody to run the House. There's got to be somebody to run the Senate. And so the way that uh, it is set up here in Texas, it kind of mirrors that of the U.S. level at Congress and at the and the U.S. Senate. And so uh, at the, in the Texas legislature, we have the lieutenant governor. We don't have a vice, a vice governor. It's called the lieutenant governor. And then we have the Speaker of the House. All right, let's talk a little bit about the lieutenant governor. And you probably have never even heard of this position. Most people haven't. But the lieutenant governor serves as the president of the Texas Senate. And so he derives his power from, very, uh, from numerous uh, different uh, aspects. And so the first thing that he is able to do is he has this thing called his legislative agenda. And so I'm going to be using that term agenda a lot in this course. And this is what it means. There's certain things that he wants passed. And the way that they need to get passed is that it needs to go through the legislature because the legislature is the one that passes the laws. So he's saying this is important to him. Like at this particular point in time, one thing that's really troubling him is like the increase in tuition. That tuition at uh, state universities has been increasing and increasing and increasing. So he's trying to figure out, okay, well, what can be done to stop these increases without the legislature having to put out more money? So that's that's the sticky part right there. Okay, so that's like an agenda item. That's one of the his the things that he's going to be advancing. One of the agenda items that he's going to be advancing. Uh, the second part, the organizational structure, relates to the committees. The way the committees are set up, who's going to chair the committee, who's going to be serving on that committee. And in the next part of this lecture, we're going to be talking all about committees. There's a lot to be said about committees. Now this one called the procedural rules, that relates to the legislative process of how a piece of legislation is advancing in order to become a law. And so there are certain procedural rules that must, must be followed. Now you can suspend some of the rules and it's usually up to the Lieutenant Governor for the Texas Senate to either abide by the rules or suspend the rules in order to either advance a piece of legislation or just to kill it. Now this thing called administrative policy and management, what that relates to is that uh, the the uh, legislature has like a watchdog function. Again, I'll use that word oversight, which is basically means it's like a watchdog function over the state agencies uh, in Texas. And so uh, they have a whole section that will do, and, and these are called the, uh, the institutional tools of the legislature. But uh, they will have the oversight function of the administrative policy and the management for the state agencies within the state of Texas. Now the Lieutenant Governor 
uh, has to stand for office. He is actually part of the plural executive that we talked about way back when we talked about the Constitution. And so he will run based on his uh, party. It's a partisan election. And uh, he will run uh, for a four-year term. And again, no term limits. So he has to be elected. And it is possible that uh, the lieutenant govern governor may be from a different party than the governor. I think that's only happened once in the long history of Texas. Now, it's not a very highly visible office. As I said, most people have never even heard of the lieutenant governor. But it is one of the most powerful of, uh, office, uh, offices in the state. And in many ways, it's even more powerful than the office of the governor. Now, when it comes to the Speaker of the House, the way that a, a speaker gets to be a speaker is that uh, he, he will be the presiding officer for the House of Representatives and the, it's the House members that will vote him in by a majority vote. And it is always going to be somebody from the majority party. Okay, that's another way of saying right now the House of Representatives is very Republican, so the Speaker of the House will also be a Republican. And so in order to get that majority vote, the Democrats have to agree that this is the person that they want to be serving as a Speaker of the House. You know, the Speaker of the House, his name is uh, Strauss. Joe Strauss, the lieutenant governor's name is, is Dan Patrick. So those are the two in the legislative leadership. I might be throwing their names around. Uh, Strauss is from San Antonio. Uh, Patrick is from the Houston area. Uh, they have tried to get rid of spouse, uh, Strauss many times, but they haven't been able to do that yet because he's considered to be more of an establishment Republican. Remember that term? A more moderate, re moderate Republican. Dan Patrick is very Tea Party very conservative. Okay, so the legislative leadership then, and I mentioned this already, it's the Lieutenant Governor, Dan Patrick, the Speaker of the House, Joe Strauss, and the committee chairs, the committee chairs. Okay, so in the next section, we're going to be talking a lot more about the committees. We're going to be talking about the procedure that they have to go through uh, in order to get the pieces of legislation passed.